Alrighty, so it's Monday at the time that I'm recording this, and hopefully it means that it'll be Monday at the time that I'm uploading this. Not botching like last week. <laughs> so thanks once again for tuning in to another OTR Essential Q&A video. I'm ready to get started, and I hope you are. And if you aren't, then why the hell did you click on the video to begin with? Which probably some of you are already asking. Alright, so let's see what questions we got this week. Coming for Hogan wants to know... What match sounded horrible on paper, but the storyline got you invested, and the match exceeded your expectations? Hmm. I'm going to go Sting Hogan Bound for Glory. I think it was 2011, was it? Because on paper, you're thinking about Hogan with the back problems and an old kind of out-of-shape Sting, and you're like, this is going to be a train wreck to watch. But if you remember watching on the old Off the Rope Show channel during that time, I was all in on the feud itself. Sting and Hogan. You know, I was like, just sign on the bottom of the You know, and ultimately we got it. And I loved the story. At least I did. And then the match exceeded expectations to a degree. But I had a feeling what would go on. You're going into Philadelphia. Yes, you're going into smirky territory, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day... It's Hogan, it's Sting, then you throw Flair into the mix and a bunch of other people into the mix. That crowd is going to eat that shit up. And that shit was fucking incredible to me. I don't care. Yes, it was all about nostalgia pops. If you want, like, work rate and, oh, fuck off. Every once in a while, it doesn't matter. In this type of match here, it didn't matter. I love that match. It's just, I really do. Uh, Declonious Games, could a Cena-Undertaker match save WrestleMania 32? Now, I just did a video yesterday talking about how if Ambrose needs somebody at WrestleMania, Taker would be the guy. I want to make one contingency on that. Is that Cena's not there at WrestleMania. I still wonder if Cena's not going to come back in time. I still wonder if he's not going to bull rush through his rehab and find a way to overcome and increase his HGH injections. I don't know. At the end of the day, I think they're still going to do John Cena versus Undertaker WrestleMania 32. And yes, in theory, that match could save WrestleMania 32. Because you can count on Cena at a certain point to do certain things and deliver in a certain way. And by God, at the end of the day, if you're ever going to count on anybody to save a WrestleMania, it's going to be The Undertaker. So yes, that match very possibly could save WrestleMania 32, and it would be the shot in the arm that that show is going to need. It is going to be something interesting, something different, one of those what would happen at WrestleMania type of things and have people really wondering what the finish is going to be and who's going to win and how it's all going to go down. I'd be incredibly interested in hell, yes. And then he also asked, who do you see retiring first, John Cena or Randy Orton? Uh, ooh, good question. Um, maybe Cena, because he's going to get interested in other things and his body's going to keep breaking down. So I might go Cena, although I wouldn't be surprised if Orton said enough is enough at some point in time, too. <clears throat> Michael Corvin, is there any hope at all of undoing the damage done to Bray Wyatt and the rest of the Wyatt family caused by WWE? There's always a hope. Is it a great hope? I don't know about that. Is it a realistic hope? I don't know about that either. But there's a hope. It can be undone. It just might take more to undo it. But it can be done. David B. Robinson, also known as Retro Gamer 1995. Why is there a disconnect between the hardcore audience and WWE? I guess it depends. Hardcore fans tend to take the business, the product, the entertainment genre more seriously. So as a result, they're going to look at certain things and quantify certain things as being more important than people that kind of like it, but they don't, you know, make it a consuming part of their life like we do when we come on the internet and we talk about wrestling. It is a consuming part of our lives. It's not necessarily our entire lives, but it's a consuming part of our lives, no question about it. So we're going to value things differently than more casual or mainstream fans would necessarily. And WWE, when they've been at their biggest, it's been when they've had the, the lion's share of their audience actually be those casual mainstream viewers. So those are the viewers that they're going to want to appeal to first. So the hardcore fan base is frustrated because they want things their way, even though if they get everything their way, it's frankly going to make for a shitty product, especially at the WWE level. And all the while, the WWE wants to sit there and push towards this audience, and if that's the only audience they're going to push towards, then that's going to result in a shitty product, too. As much as you can, you want to try and be something for everyone. You want to give everybody something. You want to give something for everyone. 
you know, find a happy medium, find a mix. I think it's interesting, though, is that the hardcore fan base really needs the WWE in certain ways um, because the entire state of the business in general isn't that great. I mean, you know, people like Lucha Underground, and I can't blame them because of the way it's presented and just how different it feels. Um, but, you know, in general, the business is just not in a good place. It just isn't. ROH is still lame. TNA is pretty lame, too. And you look at WWE, especially if you're a hardcore fan, and you see the fact that they're giving you more emphasis on in-ring action than probably any time in their entire history as a company for what you might feel is better, what was probably actually the worst. So you kind of need them. On the other hand, the WWE needs the hardcore fans because... Without them, the WWE Network is a complete and total failure. So on the one hand, they want to go in this direction, but on the other hand, they have no choice but to go in this direction to a certain degree because if they don't, their network is a complete fucking flop and then all hell breaks loose. So it's, again, about finding a happy medium. There's always been a disconnect there because fans live in a bubble. The wrestling business lives in a bubble. And everybody in this bubble thinks they're right. Everybody in this bubble thinks they're right and they know better. And all the while, nobody really knows and nobody really knows better. Um... Swag Pizza 27, is there a TNA match that you truly enjoyed? If so, what is it? Well, there's been several TNA matches over the years that I can think of. I just mentioned Sting and Hogan at Bound for Glory. Wasn't it at the same show? You had um, James Storm versus Bobby Roode. Or was that the next year? Either way, whatever year Bound for Glory that was, my memory is slipping at my advancing age. Uh, but I love that match between James Storm and Bobby Roode. You know, when Austin Aries became the TNA World Heavyweight Champion, that was something that I personally enjoyed. I mean, there have been matches over the years in TNA that I've enjoyed. I just don't enjoy the product today. And then you also ask, how do you pick up women? Yeah, I don't know if you should be saying something like that in the sense that they're just property that you pick up. I guess, you know, 17th stretch century lives strong within you. Uh, <laughs> nor am I in any position where I would need to do that anymore. Uh, but nonetheless... Just be confident. Never assume that somebody is out of your league because maybe they're you're out of their league. You know, be confident. Be sure of who you are. That's a tip for you of something to help you. You know, be confident. Sound like you know what you're talking about. Sound like you know where you want to go. You know, don't be a jelly back meaning somebody without a spine. Um, let's see here. I'm just reading through to see what other questions I could find. I know there's got to be more. Um, oh, Samuel Shepard, good one here. Crooked Sam 64 asks, as a UK citizen, I'm pondering whether or not to leave uh, or to vote leave in the EU referendum. As an American, what say you? Um, I have to be honest, it's not something that particularly affects me a tremendous deal. So I don't pay a ton of attention to it. I probably would vote leave. I know some people might make an argument as to why you should stay in the EU. You know, I just kind of feeds into that whole thing of a one global economy, which can have some potentially disastrous consequences. That's just kind of what my fear is. But again, I haven't, to be honest with you, in the interest of full disclosure, I come up with this big, long answer one way or another, but I just haven't done enough research, nor do I frankly care enough to give you a truly honest piece of advice, you know, or opinion. Uh, Aaron Grigorich, what is your opinion of the presidential campaign now as the Democrats and Republicans head to South Carolina? Oh, God. My first thought is, this is it. My second thought is, in eight years, this is the best that both sides could come up with. My next thought is, you know, it actually makes me long for Mitt Romney. That's how bad it's been. And I don't think I'm the only person that says, I kind of wish Mitt Romney was running this time because he would be uh, the best of the bunch and definitely the lesser of all the evils. You know, I just, in terms of the Republicans, uh, we'll start there. You know, when you talk about Rubio, you know, he's at one of those, he, he would be an establishment type of choice, very programmed and very rehearsed, um, somebody that really has trouble eloquating a point off of the cuff, has to be prepared, has to be in a control environment, which makes him a kind of ideal establishment Republican. Um, 
there, I have a respect factor for John Kasich, and he's a guy that's done some good things over the years. I just don't know that I would want to be president. I, he strikes me as more of a really solid uh, vice presidential type of candidate. Uh, ben Carson's a knucklehead. I can't believe he's still in the damn race. Jeb Bush never got on traction, never got on point with a clear-cut message. Um, just wasn't the right timing for him on top of the fact that you've got one candidate who's so eloquently speaking out against George W. Bush. Now you've got his brother and people are being reminded about, do you really want the Bush dynasty? So you could have all the establishment, the super PAC money behind him. But if he's not resonating with the people and Jeb Bush's message is not resonating with the people, he's not a good debater. He's not somebody that gives these glorying oratories. You know, I'm not surprised he struggled. Ted Cruz is such a fucking joke. I mean, when the guy is sitting there and saying in 80 years that no Supreme Court justice has been confirmed in the last year of a president's term, you know, I, I ask, well, what about, uh, who was it? It was, uh, I think it was Kennedy that was, Justice Kennedy that was confirmed in 88, which would have been Reagan's last year. What the fuck do I know? Here's a guy that so often cites the Constitution, yet so often clearly doesn't read or comprehend or understand the Constitution in any way, shape, or form, just from a constitutional standpoint, is wrong on so many particular issues. Donald Trump, you know, one thing I will say about him is he's had the courage, to a degree, to say some things that will even piss off the Republican base and the Republican establishment, um, especially when it comes to Bush and the Iraq War, you know, calling out of the bullshit of how the fuck did Bush keep us safe because he didn't, and that's a ridiculous narrative that needs to go the fuck away. Um, but, you know, there to me, Donald Trump is a lot of show and not much dough in the sense of the substance of what he would be doing. You know, and it, it he's resonating with a certain segment. He's a guy that I'm not that surprised because in a lot of ways, like I said before, I thought he was the, the perfect GOP candidate. Not, not quite in the establishment, mind you, but I thought he was really the perfect GOP candidate. And I've been kind of validated and vindicated about that. I, I said a long time ago, he's not as much of a joke as people want to make him out to be. Um, you know, but again, I say this is the best that we can do. You know, just so many things where he's living on fucking Fantasy Island talking about we'll, we'll build the wall and make Mexico pay for it. How? How the fuck are you going to do that? He had clearly has no grasp of foreign policy whatsoever. Um, you know, from an economic standpoint, the guy who's had four different businesses declare bankruptcy, is that the guy that you want running the country? You know, it's, it's all on the Republican side, in particular when they focus on the debt and how much the debt is and how much of a problem the debt is. To me, I say this. It's not just a debt. It's what do you have to show for the debt? It'd be one thing if our debt was $19 trillion and our borders were completely secure. We had an up-to-date modern infrastructure with all types of renewable energy sources where we weren't dependent on foreign oil. If our education system was top-notch and the spending was equivalent across the board in all different types of communities in all different types of ways. If we had quality health care available for all citizens and all people in the U.S., you know, things like that. Um, safe water to drink, those type of things. If we had all of those things and we had a $19 trillion debt, then at least we could say we've accomplished a lot with this. We've got something to show for it. The problem is, is it's similar to when people run up huge credit card debts. They have all this debt and they have nothing really to fucking show for it. And that's the problem with this country. It's not just the debt alone. It's the fact that we have all of this debt and we have no real way to be able to unbury ourselves from it because we've made our citizenry so dependent upon the infrastructure of the government. And at the same point in time, the government is so dependent on that infrastructure that has been built. You know, and then you've got these guys talking about tax cuts being a way to close the fucking debt hole. And you're just fucking idiots. The supply side shit needs to fuck off. And then you've got Hillary, who's as friendly to the big banks as anybody in the fucking race. You know, you've got people sitting there thinking about the 90s like they were some great time. And in certain aspects, they were. And in other aspects, they weren't. And they created some real problems. And in particular, what astounds me is why so many people in the black and Hispanic communities, in particular the black community, would support Hillary Clinton. Need I remind you, the presidency of Bill Clinton was not all that particularly great. 
to that community. It was not. The getting tough on crime, which led to a disproportionate incarceration level for black Americans, in particular young black males, for way too long, for way too little. You know, the subprime mortgage crisis and how many subprime loans were given out during the Clinton era, the defense of marriage, it's just all these things. And then Bernie Sanders, you've got angry grandpa. You know, it's one of these things, he's got these principles, some I agree with, some I really don't. You know, again, it's like some other people in general, I think there should be an age limit on how old somebody can be to run for president, and that's just the way I feel about it. You know, and all the while, here's a guy that we talk about his principles and all of this, but he was so principled that he made sure he joined up with the Democrats just in time to run for president. Furthermore, I think some of his policies are too narrow in scope, too narrow in focus, and I think after all of this time, it speaks to me to a lack of something and a lack of understanding and a lack of quality of ground game and campaign structure that he can't more effectively get out his message to those disenfranchised minority voters. I mean, there are a lot of black and Hispanic Americans that think Hillary Clinton is the better choice for them. And they couldn't be any more fucking wrong. But Bernie Sanders still can't get that message across. He still can't appeal to them. Yeah. You know, it's like in a lot of ways, both parties almost have went to the white is right and the only light type of philosophy in this campaign cycle. Just astounding to me. Just astounding. What I wouldn't give for a better option. And know somebody like a Michael Bloomberg is not fucking it. Fuck him too. Uh, let's see here. Majestad. Would you be okay with Reigns winning the belt at WrestleMania 32 if it means building up him up for Rollins or Ambrose or someone at WrestleMania 33, well, that's you giving him an entire year's worth of title reign. Let's slow down there a little bit, Junior. Yeah, I'm okay with Reigns getting the belt, you know, especially if it means he works a program with Ambrose at some point in time. You know, if you turned him heel and you brought back Rollins as a face, again, that's going to work because, you know, the thing is with Reigns, you've got the matzo ball out there. If you've never went all the way with him and Rollins, and you still haven't gone all the way with him and Ambrose yet, so you've got two natural feuds built right in that could last you months. That have got tons of story and background to them that can get people invested. You know, I think with Ambrose, they might turn him heel, where the better answer might be if they're in a feud is to turn Reigns heel, especially though with a returning Rollins, where they might want to have the temptation to heal him out. Yeah, I think you would have to re heal Reigns out to make it work properly. But it's not to say that it wouldn't work properly. Um, but a whole year of a Reigns title reign? I don't know about that. Pussyhole Paul, great name. If Ziggler grew a handlebar mustache, could he be the best Hulk Hogan since he looks like him and has his charisma? <laughs> fuck Dolph Ziggler. And what the fuck makes you think that Dolph Ziggler has charisma? What the fuck makes you think that he could even grow a handlebar mustache? What makes you think that even if he did, that in any way, shape, or form, he should even be given the honor of trying to impersonate somebody like a legend like Hulk Hogan? At least Charlie Haas did it right, damn it. Haas Hogan FTW. Let's see here. Uh, your mother's arse. <laughs> Have you seen any of the Saw films? And if so, what are your thoughts on the franchise? No. You know what's funny is I love uh, shows about the paranormal and supernatural but I hate horror movies in general. Just weird how that works out. People sometimes come up to me when they find out this. They're like, what, are you scared of horror movies? I said, no, because I'll watch uh, Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters and all these other paranormal shows and supernatural shows all the time. And I love them. I eat them up. I'll sit an entire day and just watch nothing but them. I said, and that shit that's more realistic to me, that shit that's much more likely to happen. That shit that I've actually experienced. So, so it's not a fear thing. I just don't like the horror movie genre in general. Sure, I mean, there will be classics that I like. You know, Friday the 13th, Halloween, especially living here. I gotta watch it all the time because her. Uh, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, there are some classics, yes, that I will watch, but in general, I just don't like that entire genre. Uh, Andy Boo's What Non Wrestling Role Would You Give Daniel Bryan? Um, obviously, there could be several roles. You know, to, to help ease the pain for fans of him not being in the ring anymore, I'd love to see him be an authority figure on TV, a general manager. You know, something along those lines. Um, maybe somebody that you would bring in to be an agent at NXT or maybe an agent on the main roster. You know, it, it, there's, there's different options for him. Uh, I hope he chooses a role with him at some point in time. Um, let's see here. Jimmy Puravoy. If Nikki Bella doesn't return to the WWE, do you think Dana Brooke 
could take her spot. God, I don't think so, and I really, really hope not. Let's see here. Uh, Hunter Hastings, as much of a dick as EC3 is, why do you think the fans like him so much? You know, fans like when somebody treats them like shit sometimes and not saying they don't deserve to be treated like shit, but sometimes we do. Um, I think they see a guy like EC3 who never really got an opportunity in WWE, who went to TNA, got a gimmick, was given a chance, and did something with it. You know, so why? Yeah, why not? Uh, let's see here. Any other questions? Any other questions? Let's see here. I don't really think so. I think we'll call it a wrap here. Um, yeah, let's see here. I'm just checking. Nope, and I think that's it. All right, so thanks to everyone who tweeted your questions uh, for this Q&A episode. Hope you enjoyed this. It wasn't the best, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, check out some of the other videos. Instead of doing a triple threat video this week, I did three separate topical videos about who Dean Ambrose should face at WrestleMania 32, uh, who maybe Daniel Bryan fans should support now. And again, a suggestion, not a requirement or demand. It was just a thought. And then uh, how Chris Jericho and AJ Styles should be something special, but it ultimately isn't. So watch out for those. And sorry about not doing a Raw review for this past week's show. Just other things came up, and then I was doing other videos, and I just decided, ah, screw it. I'll be doing a Raw review on Tuesday, though, so stay tuned for that.